I'd love for you to introduce to us about your first business and what products you sell and how you started. When we first started, we started distributing some. Uh, so eventually we got into that brand called La La Land. Uh, but before that, we were distributing under another company name like Home and Human Fashion. And we, we started in importing some um, stationery and gift and homeware from France. And we gradually um, transitioned into creating our own range of products uh, with all the stationery made in Australia and the gift and homeware made overseas. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I have Ludovine here. She has a farm to provide people with animal assisted therapy. And I would love to share with you more about her story so that you can find new ways to uncover your potential, to find creative ways to move into your career and your opportunities. Thank you so much, Ludovine, for joining me today. Yeah, well, it was a, a spontaneous kind of uh, idea that we had to, to make this conversation as we just met, and I we, would say, a few hours ago. <laughs> exactly. And we really clicked on a lot of topics. So I would love to share with you uh, what she does and also how she got there. Mm. Well, maybe I'll start with how I got there mm -hmm. because it makes to me more sense is I struggled in my life uh, with some mental health issues, um, depression, chronic depression, um, anxiety. And what I found was the most helpful in addition to traditional therapy, like seeing a psychologist, is spending some time in nature and with animals it really provided me some calmness that I was not finding and it made me really reconnect with my body but I was not really aware of the mechanism of how it was working mm. but when I really in my previous career I was a, a business owner with a business partner and I went to a point where I really burn out from leading like a small business, even with a business partner, it's it's really stressful to run uh, a small business. There's a lot of um, everyday stress with your employees, your cash flow, and I was not supporting myself. I was really, I feel, given 100% to my business and not having any balance with also even my family or thinking mm. about myself. So. When I really burned out and I took some time off, it was really a reality check that I've been neglecting my own needs for a long time and prioritizing kind of goals like making my business successful mm -hmm. at the cost of, at the expense of uh, my personal well-being mentally and physically. After I burned out, I came back to my business and realized that it was no longer working for me. It was scary, but I decided to, without knowing what I was going to do next, to get out of um, that business. I sold the shares of my business and I'm very grateful about the 10 years experience I had in my business. But uh, after 10 years, it was no longer what I expected. I got lost in it and I thought like I needed to do something drastically different. Mm -hmm. And I went through a long period of introspection, really thinking, well, I sold my business. I made a decent amount of money from the sale of my business. What can I do now that will help me to really have balance in my life? Mm -hmm. So really putting myself first for the first time in my life. While also, I was so grateful that reconnecting with nature and animals helped me so much. How can I share this journey? And I've always dreamt of having a farm, but I thought it was kind of, a, oh, I'll have a hobby farm and we can go on weekends. And then I thought, like, hang on, like, why can't I make a new career with that dream? Like, kind of putting the, the pieces of the puzzles together. I would like a farm. I want to have more balance with my family um, work life. I've got, I'm in a position where I've got a bit of money, so I'm not in too much rush. Because that's also some sometimes like you have to be realistic. But I had that opportunity and also like let myself like having this opportunity like mm, to be open to the opportunity. For yeah, yourself. but not also things like oh I'm so um, what's the word like not going back to work straight away because I mm. felt like in the past I've been really conditioned with how what are people gonna think like if I'm not working for let's say six months because I'm working on a project that is really dear to me. What are my family going to think? What are my, are they going to think I'm lazy? Are they going to, like putting some labels on yourself and being harsh with yourself and not being like, 
well, like kind of changing the narrative instead of being, I worked hard, I built that business and it cost me a lot, but now why can't I really focus on a project that is dear to me rather than rush into what society I feel is expecting of me? That was a very big, uh, there was also a period of grief. After I sold my business, we discussed together, um, my previous business partner and I, we built this business um, like from scratch, just going to shop selling. We were wholesaling products, uh, really doing everything, deliveries and packing and uh, accounting, everything. And we built it to a fairly decent sized business. And when you've been involved in a business like that, when I gave it all, I feel I could. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a period uh, of grief, mm -hmm. like to let go as well. And letting go is also important because if you don't let go, you can't look forward to what's next. So it was kind of a transition where I was grieving, but also thinking, okay, if I really think about what I want to do, really what I want to do, not what I feel everyone expects of me, what would it look like? And really allowing myself to say like, can it actually happen? And just dreaming of it and, and then seeing like, well, maybe can I, what can I do to, to get there? And I started thinking like I wanted, I'd been going back horse riding because there was something that I was doing in my childhood and I was really enjoying that, spending time uh, with horses and I was, okay, I want to also have some, a new direction. I can't, I don't want to just stay at home. I want to do a job and, and a meaningful job. So I started to think, how can I help other people? It's always something I was wanting to do have a meaningful career enjoy animals having a farm and then the project slowly came together and mm -hmm. i thought I'll, I'll just do it one block at a time so mm -hmm. i first did my training in a, um with the epi which is a equine psychotherapy institute i did a, a course in um, equine assisted uh, learning so just to clarify i'm a non-therapy service so i, I provide some programs for, about learning some life skills like awareness, mindfulness, learning about boundaries, uh, facing life's challenging, regulating your emotions, which are skills, as we discussed this morning, that are so overlooked in yes. our society where it's, it's focusing on a more kind of academic system where everyone needs to fit the same mold. Uh, mold. And I guess that's why, like you, also, I was so kind of like, what is a society expecting from me now? Like, I can't. We're not really used to look within. We look about. I felt I, for many, many years, I left. I lived my life thinking, how can I, how can I fit the best in society and uh, and please everyone, my um, family, my yes. friends, and like when I was thinking of having a farm, I thought like, oh, it's a selfish dream. Mm. When I was thinking of having animals, uh, uh, it's not going to work. It's just a dream. And you kind of put them aside and reject them because you feel it's too, too good for you almost. You know, we were, thinking about, we were talking about self-worth and you feel you're not good enough to deserve to do what you're happy. If you read kind of like the subtext that is underneath. Yes, yeah. yes. that as if it's not okay to do something that brings us joy. Yeah. And I want to say like... I was in a fortunate place to um, to buy a farm, but I want to say if people have dreams, like I could have still realized my dream. Uh, I'm working um, at the moment as a um, as a contractor in another property. Even if you don't have like the money to, let's say, if you want to work with animals, or there's always ways. Is what I'm saying. Yes, it's yes, like to find new ways. Yeah, I, I want to, people to hear that it's not. Oh, uh, yeah, she made it because um, she was able to buy a farm. What I want to say is that I kind of looked at it and think like, if I didn't have that chance, would I still have been able? Because equality is very important for me, and I, I feel there's always a way. And it might look slightly different from one person to another, but there's always a way if you have a dream and you're really passionate about it to make it happen. Um, even if you don't have the big dollars, but you can always find ways to make it happen and it can start really small. But if you have the dream, you're going to build up on that every little step closer to your dream. And you might not. And sometimes you feel you have a dream and you actually start uh, discovering that your actual 
dream is not what you expected and you might change direction but follow your dream and you might go like oh that's not exactly what i thought it was what i was expecting and uh, i'm not being scared of changing directions as well not yes. being too obsessed with um one goal and feeling like oh it's not that and just giving up just tweaking 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 it's a it's something that i've learned from my previous business is being adaptive Sometimes you have a plan and then, well, your plan sometimes doesn't work. It doesn't mean that you can't go to plan B, C, D, and every plan B, you might go to another branch. And it's it's not a linear um, trajectory, if that makes sense. I feel it, I'm talking does. a lot. <laughs> no, this is perfect. I mm -hmm. actually want to bounce off you. So yeah. I had a very similar experience mm -hmm. where I felt like I had a goal. I was obsessed with a goal. Yeah. And when I did not reach it, it would become really frustrating. Yeah. So I've And learned... you feel like you... Uh, you failed yes and that's yes. if you start like that it's very frustrating yeah, yeah but also like you're not gonna reach your goal straight away there are gonna be a lot of failure it's trial and error a lot of testing yeah. yes and, 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 it's, and it's normal it's don't mm. feel like if you try something and it doesn't work just like fall it and go to the next mm. uh, step and say okay that doesn't work and great i tested it mm -hmm. and that's not that's not the way I should do things. And it might be for a different reason. Like it doesn't suit you or it's not um, working with the public you're wanting to, to tap. So I have a friend who, because she's trying to figure out what aligns with her purpose and her goals yeah. and her strengths, she's been testing out different things. And because things aren't ex what she expected to be, she found herself very frustrated and mm. burnt out. What advice would you give people who are experiencing Is she like clear that? about values because sometimes it's not mm. about goals it's about being clear about your values mm, i'm not quite sure actually i would go back to kind of not testing i would go back to maybe um, your goals might be that it might not be like i want i'm just going to make uh, uh, an interior designer like let's say i want to be an interior designer that might be a goal but maybe your goal should be like i want to make something that every day i I love like mm -hmm. and well every day they're gonna be parts you don't love but I would be more broad in your values mm. if that makes sense really understand your uh, spend some time understanding yourself before you set some goals if that makes sense yeah because she, she says she doesn't really know what she wants yeah yeah well that's does she have some passions though she does yeah so she has some passions and she, but she doesn't know um, how she should execute that in a career yeah, well, I would recommend like really putting a list of passions because when you start with something you love, you can't go wrong. And maybe do some, I, I like to draw, so I would take a big piece of paper. And is she looking at some careers or? She is, but she, when she delves into it, she thinks she'll love it and then she realizes not what she thinks. Oh, so what I would do is like, and I've done that a lot, is maybe getting some uh, work experience, just saying like, uh, mm. let's say you want to be a vet, maybe just contact some vets and like, rather to go too much into an area, see if it's really what you think it is, because sometimes it's not. So yeah. just most people will be happy if you want to do some work experience and just observe and uh, or talk to people that might know someone and you might mm. be able to spend a day or a week with them. But I would start with drawing really what your uh, passions are and what kind of directions you can take to really map it and clear and have mm. it clear and what are your values in life as well like on side by side wow um and just like yeah just with mm -hmm. markers and and draw it because i think it brings clarity when you got it and you might do different like draft and like really put it down to paper or get someone to help her sometimes you we've got too much directions as well like really narrow it down to really what is your core passion like and trying to be very precise if mm. that makes sense for example me it was working in nature mm. and working with animals i okay. might not have been doing animal assisted therapy i was thinking like i want to help people and so that's very specific yes. but it can be in different way yes i want to work with animals and i want to work in nature mm. And then it's really specific, but it's quite broad at the same time. You see yeah. what I mean? Really like it's specific in um, what areas, but broad in terms of how it can be executed. Yes. Yes. If okay. that makes sense. That's yeah. why like, I wanted to 
give some example because mm -hmm. sometimes we go too much one way or another. Mm. You go like, I want to do that job, which is too precise. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I understand. It's it more like thinking of an industry, mm -hmm. maybe okay. like, yeah. And you said that and be open your, yeah. to to yeah to to try something and it doesn't work for you mm. yeah uh, you said you had to adapt a lot in the 10 years of that business can you share a little bit about how you did that and what kind of challenges you overcame yeah. well to 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 start from the beginning we started with the idea of importing japanese um, products like kind of um, creative products like something that is not really seen in australia and then we very quickly got faced with it was difficult to work with Japanese um, suppliers because of uh, just communication. Um, website of Japanese suppliers, or what well, it's it's now like almost fifteen years ago, like were really not easy to to oh. work with. It was it's really it was really difficult to work. Mm. So we thought like we're gonna have those funky kind of designer products from Japan. Very quickly we found out that uh, well as much as we would love to do it, it's not working. Then we, I went like, hang on, I'm French. So why don't we import some cool products from France? And we started with like five different suppliers. And at first we tried and very, very quickly, we narrowed it down to one supplier that was more successful for us. So for maybe nine months, we had five suppliers. Then we narrowed it down to three and because some of the products we we chose were not successful and that's okay and start little like don't start too big because you might not be right in your predictions as well especially if you're doing something quite unique mm -hmm. um because we started with a very limited of amount of money like um we had money to buy our first lot of products we imported and then every time we sold it was getting slowly bigger and bigger and narrowing it down like by trial and error to what kind of style was working more, mm -hmm. what kind of products was working more, what kind of shops were working better with our products. And then like after a while we found out that once we, we were small and working from home, having like kind of our stock in one of our spare rooms, once we wanted to get to the next level, we needed to employ people, uh, have an office. so. As, so, as soon as you do that, like your your expenses increase a lot. So what we were getting in terms of uh, margin from the supplier we we're buying from was not enough. So we had a conversation with them saying like, we're going to start producing some um, greeting cards in Australia so that we can make enough money to support our growth because it was not viable. and. And then the same set of problems that like we started with something that we thought would uh, suit the market. And we were kind of trying to mimic what was working from the other brand rather than trust what we thought the Australian market wanted. And it's then we started to be a little bit more confident with our choices and be confident to try things that might not work. And that's also something that can be confronting for a lot of people is taking risks. But small risks you don't mm. have to take a massive risk but you if there's something you really like and you like to show it let's say to the public and but you're not sure they're gonna like it or not try it but measured risks yeah so that's you're not gonna launch a whole like for in our um example like if we had 120 products we might choose like 10 products that are risky mm, okay and some that we have more from past experience something that would work and you build up on what works and always have some room for risk mm. because it's important to evolve as well and adapt and and sometimes also something you do um, might work for a while and no longer work and it's we've seen in the industry some companies that regardless of what was going on were staying in the same tracks and we saw them struggling you have to um, be able to let go of things and kind of or think of yourself as something that is always evolving yeah uh, and so you it sounds like there were two testing phases one testing phase was in the beginning where you're trying to figure out the market yes yeah. imported products the second phase where you focused more on Australian made products yeah can you tell me a bit about uh, what how long that 
learning phase, the testing phase was, and uh, uh, how you you know honed in on what the market wanted? Yeah, well, I think we imported um, French products for about three years. Mm -hmm. And there was a phase where we had the two side by side. So it started with us having 25% of our own brand mm -hmm. and like 75 and then 50 and then the the company we were distributing was not too happy with our uh, kind of share of our product growing and they decided they no longer wanted to work with us so we kind of like we were like maybe 40 percent we had to come up with a much bigger range really quickly so wow. from pretty much in one season so we really wow. had to because they dropped us quite suddenly yes um even though we had communicated mm -hmm. uh, I think they didn't expect that it was going to be successful for us, mm. so I don't know. Um, and then we're starting doing like the stationery, like with a bigger range, like in, uh, adding notebooks and posters and things like that. And then we started also importing, but like from Asia, because we wanted to remain in Australia as much as possible. But the reality was in some product category, uh, we would have been at a price range that was not, we were on kind of the middle range, not the the really cheap products, but not the luxury. We didn't, we wanted to appeal to, uh, not appeal, but be affordable to, to most mm -hmm. people. So that's why we decided to, to work with some suppliers overseas, um, mostly from China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the second phase of growth uh, in the testing experience, uh, how long was that for as well? it was probably two years where we really got mm -hmm. kind of our niche and that was at the beginning i would say we were quite early in in doing some australiana products like now it's really big and really kind of all big brands are into it but mm. at the beginning we saw a niche that there was a lot of tacky souvenir like that were with Australiana like some really bad drawing and we wanted to revamp it and um, so we came up with a lot of uh, fauna and flora and that's really what took off for us um, the Australiana range and and then it was always evolving like it's as I said it's never the growth was and I think I've left the business now for three years and I'm sure they're still evolving is what I'm saying it's like when you are it depends on what industry I think any industry any business you have to think of yourself as recreating yourself all the time. You might have your core, but there's always parts that's going to mm. change and evolve. And how did you start the idea of providing these sort of products? Well, it was really funny because my previous business partner worked um, from a Japanese um, kind of high-end textile brand that was doing some linen. And they were not successful when they tried to implement in Australia for various reasons. But when they decided to oh hello hello, hello. a very old company in uh, in japan and they're very successful in japan but when they tried to kind of copy and paste their strategy from japan to here it was not successful because they were a bit rigid in their way they wanted to to work in australia so they decided to close down the operations and they had a lot of foot on you know those uh, flat cushions okay that my well it was not my business partner it was my friend at the time like decided they had like few hundreds of them and say they were selling them at a really reduced cost so that's how we started we started with those japanese cushions oh wow and then we were like oh we've got this japanese cushion why not import some japanese designer products and we found out quite quickly that it was much more difficult than we had anticipated trying to source some suppliers from Japan because of uh, a like none of us none of us two uh, were speaking Japanese and communicating by email or looking at product range on website was really difficult. And then I went like, hang on, I'm French. Why don't I start uh, looking for cool supplies? But it's like French. Produce, uh, products are quite famous for having kind of a, a French touch and we brought up some cool products to Australia like including some um, vinyl stickers some uh, um, to decorate rooms there were not really any in Australia at the time and some uh, gift and did diverse like gift and homeware some cool products and quite quickly one 
of the supplier, one brand that we were distributing kind of took off more than the others. So we kind of culled slowly the other one and focused on that brand. And then after a while, financially, when we started to grow and not work from home, we had to get an office, get a first employee. The margin we were getting with that supplier was were not really sustainable for us when we started. We had a lot of things we didn't know. We were just out of uni as well. And um, I still remember like some clients we visited. It's like, are you doing that all wrong when we were showing our price list? And we were like, but we had like kind of the, um, we were not worried about making mistakes. And uh, well, sometimes we got told off, but we were like, okay, we'll fix it. So we had kind of that mentality. And because it was not really viable, we decided to start a small range of uh, products. There was also a need for like uh, some clients were asking, oh, do you don't have any products made in Australia? So we started doing some greeting cards made in Australia. We communicated that to um, the supplier in France we were working with. At first they said, okay, but after a while when they saw that our style kind of I wouldn't say it was similar, but we were in the same kind of market. They thought it was not, it was a conflict of interest and they decided that they didn't no longer wanted to work with us and it was quite sudden. So all of a sudden we were like probably 40% of our products, even less, I would say probably 25% of our offering at the time was our own brand, La La Land, and the rest was that brand from France. And in one season we had to come up with a, a much bigger range to kind of, uh, um, keep the same level of income so it was risky because we also had to um, bring in other some mm -hmm. some cash to mm -hmm. to kind of uh, get that first season started and then it was a growth and it's it's growth is is great but it comes with all those challenges at every step of the way and it's stressful in terms of cash flow as well because every time you need to when you're a wholesaler you need to brings those products that you're going to send to different shops, but you need to buy in bulk, mm -hmm. in large amounts to be able to distribute to different supplies. And you need to, to come up with the cash to start that. So it's, a, it's always a bit of a headache and also get new systems, new softwares to, to kind of uh, match where you're at at each uh, step of the growth. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about how you overcame the sudden change in how the distributor just pulled out how you opened up your range and also that you moved into rather than working from home and having your products stocked at home to find uh, a space mm. how did you overcome that challenge with the cash flow and all that uh, we got a loan from the bank mm -hmm. um, that was the cash flow uh, side i put a bit of my savings as well my husband as well and got some credit cards, like really tried to pull some wow. funds from a, a lot of different. Mm -hmm. So there was also some personal risk of like just getting a loan, like the, we need to back it up with the director's guarantees. So, but we were quite confident by that stage because we'd been going on for three, four years. So mm. we knew the potential. And what was your other question? Uh, getting an office is easy. It was exciting at the time, like, but also you signing a contract commercially is so a bit scary because you kind of sign for two plus two in general is a, the minimum and you can't leave a commercial lease like that. If you leave, you need to find someone else to replace your, to take over your lease. Getting an employee, but at that stage we were excited because we were working so much. It was good to also have a mm -hmm. uh, working not from home and having kind of a space that we felt we could build our uh, identity as mm. well. Mm. So let's talk about the second half of your journey. So you were telling me earlier how you experienced burnout because yes. you were doing more of the administrative tasks rather than the creative tasks, which were more of your strengths. I wouldn't say it was my strengths, but that's uh, per se, like I say, I would say that that was what I enjoyed the most mm. uh, and so was my business partner but um, because of the way the things evolved uh, I ended up doing a lot more of the operational and uh, and the finance in the business and I felt I was carrying a lot of the stress a lot of in the I would say the cash flow was always my biggest I would say nightmare it kept me up at night because I always thought like if we have large customers that default us or for x or y reason we can't um, pay our uh, all the things that we have to pay. Like I was mm. always worried also for my employees that if we our business um, 
break down uh, goes under like uh, I felt committed to those supply uh, but to those uh, employees as well and and sometimes you have to find some cash in a very short amount of time so it's it's really mm. stressful and uh, and you know you're putting well you've got those debts as well that you're gonna have to repay at some point and and just just like running a small business and operations when you run operations every day you're facing a new thing because at every phase like we went through different um, systems like for our accounting and um, our customer service uh, programs uh, for the sales rep to to take orders in the stores like many times we had to upgrade the things and you have to learn new skills and implement and teach your staff it's it's a lot of little things and when there's things that go wrong or people that don't pay it's in the end it always comes back to you and if you feel like you just sort one problem and another one is come and hit you in the face that you didn't even think about wow. so uh, it is uh, like people sometimes like think while it's great to you on your own business it comes with uh, the good and the bad so you 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 need to to be aware of that as well like it comes with uh some risks and uh, n not always guaranteed income and uh, and there was a period when we started our business that we didn't make any money or very small amount of money for a couple of years mm. so what advice would you give people who want to start a business i would say start it part-time and like so it comes back to the idea of uh, limited risk so if you can even like if you can start it just on your weekends and then maybe when you see that there's a bit of financial success like that you're starting whatever you do like making a little bit of income gradually kind of cut down on your day job mm -hmm. and, and just do it gradually mm. because it, it is not an easy road mm -hmm. it's bumpy and it's difficult but it's i would say it's worth it but keep in mind your work-life balance and keep in mind your needs because that's mm -hmm. sometimes when you get too excited in one part of your life you kind of forget about the other part and what advice would you give in terms of overcoming obstacles and challenges in a business uh, learn to have some strategies to calm yourself and do things for yourself like remember that your business is only good if you're well mentally and physically um, because if you're putting it aside saying I'm gonna attend to it later, 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 it'll catch up with you mm. at some point. So always think about your own need, not just the needs of your business. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And I'd love to talk about your current business that you're working on, which is the farm yeah. for animal assisted therapy. Can you tell us more about what it is? Yeah, so it came with uh, after like Kind of reflection about how can i do a business but in a different way of with the learning experience that i have and how can i really put my dreams into it and i always wanted to have a farm i love animals and from my personal uh, mental health experience being in nature being with animals and I, I wasn't sure what it was about at the time why it worked so well but it was really beneficial for my mental health so I kind of, you know, I, I say I, we would draw, like I would advise your friend to draw things. So I kind of put all the things I wanted to to have in my life. Also, like make sure that I have some time for my for myself, for my family, be healthy mentally, physically, because all those things is important. When you kind of put your goals, don't forget to put those goals as well for you. Uh, animals, farm, um, um, helping others, attending to my needs, being present for my family. It's kind of, uh, you got a, a big basket of things and how can you arrange them so that you can make them happen? And then one little thing at a time. Society, we learn to ignore all our body sensation and focus about all being in our head so what it is it's observing animals and how they interact being in nature and and really be present the first step in everything we do in the programs that i lead is how to calm yourself and the calming yourself is important because if you're in your head and thinking like if i'm with you thinking oh what am i going to do for dinner Oh, I'm with you, but I'm also thinking, oh my God, um, I've got this bill to pay. 
I'm stressed about it. Um, I'm not going to really be available for you. And that's the first step of what we teach is how to calm your nervous system. The main thing is the out breath and animals do it naturally. So that's how we bring the animals. It's their model, what we're trying to teach to people because they do it with that thinking. For us now, we have to relearn how to do it because a lot of the time we spend our day tense because we're stressed with a lot of tension in our body, holding our breath and we go along like that with the thousand mm -hmm. thoughts. And so first thing is like to let go and really through the out breath is one thing because a lot of a breathing technique or better inhale exhale but what we found is when we stress a lot of the time we hold that we're holding the breath and and getting more air more air into your system if you're still holding your breath it's not really going to help you so really it's exhaling it's i would say the foundation because if you don't have that you can't learn about this the rest you can't have any awareness if you are not present because you're not going to notice awareness is noticing things that happen in your body, mm -hmm. um, feelings that you're having. How does those feelings feel in your body? Um, but also have awareness of others around you. If you just have awareness about yourself, it's kind of limited because we are social, we are social animals. So it's being aware of other people, how they communicate and not just with verbal communication, but kind of relearning nonverbal. So I'd love to ask you what benefits people can get with animal assisted therapy and how they can check it out. I would say that the first benefit that they will get is to learn how to slow down, have a better quality of life because by slowing down, really learning to calm your nervous system, you would make the most of every moment you're in. And it can be even working, but while you're working, rather than work, let's say eight hours, while ignoring your your needs is having kindness to yourself as well and be respectful of your physical needs and your mental needs to a better quality of life and not just run your life in autopilot going to work like eight to five and feeling that you have to be at your desk all the time and not moving because that's what you expected it's not healthy and i'm not saying to be lazy it's just like to be aware of your body needs to move, um, you need hydration, you need to have contact with nature. And even if you live in the city, I'm sure you can have access to a little park, a tree, um, even having some plants on your desk, little things. We are meant to live in the natural world and it's how to make the most of modern society and bring nature to you in small ways. So it's how to bring little things into um, your everyday life that can make you happier in the end and being more acceptant of yourself and of your needs, of your uniqueness and the realities that you live in a, in a society. So how can you make all those things work together to have the happiest life mm. possible? And you said that through observing how animals yeah. communicate that we can adopt these kind of behaviors and your farm is in the blue mountains yeah you told me earlier that you wanted to provide this in the city to make it more accessible to people yeah so i'm looking into how to bring those programs to the city i won't be able to bring my donkeys my horse or my goats but i have my dog and nature is a great teacher yeah i'm looking at some ideas yeah. to bring very soon cross fingers some programs here i just want to make sure it's uh it's all working well and do a little bit of trial with some uh, maybe friends of mine and see how I can adapt it because I think it's it's probably even more needed in the cities than it is in a in oh, yeah. a rural environment mm. yeah and what kind of people would you like to help with these programs well it can be um, for anyone I got a special interest um, in working with people with intellectual disability and physical disability but that's because of um, my family. I've had a brother with a Down syndrome and I had a, uh, my stepfather had a brain injury and, um, and become uh, paraplegic. So I really know what kind of challenges they're facing and I would like to improve quality of life for those people. But saying that, um, I'm happy to help anyone. And where can people find more about yourself or the programs that you offer with animal systems. Canimblafarm.au 
so it's it's quite easy uh, website and that would be I think the starting point where there would be a form that they can uh, fill to, to contact me and that would be the starting point. Thank you so much Ludomi for sharing all your stories, for sharing your business journey, how you overcame your own personal hurdles and how you're helping other people. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really inspiring to hear everything that Thank you've you. gone through and mm -hmm. to share your knowledge with all of us today. Thank yes. you so much everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>